So it's my great pleasure to welcome uh, Sean James. Uh, he's the director of uh, data center research at Microsoft. Uh, so Sean will talk about the sustainability uh, of data centers. Uh, let us just ask uh, Dr. Xi before. And so that's a very good transition, I would say. So uh, Sean runs our uh, Microsoft data center research and development program within the cloud operations and innovation org. Uh, the org provide the foundation, uh, foundational cloud infrastructure for over 1 billion customers, 20 million plus business, 200 plus Microsoft online services in 90 markets global wide. Uh, Sean drives new data center technology for Microsoft's next generation data centers, including the evaluation, development, and testing. Uh, Sean joined Microsoft in 2006 to manage operations at one of Microsoft data centers. Later, he joined the construction team and oversaw the design and building of new Microsoft data centers. Prior to joining Microsoft, Sean worked in data center management overseeing the day-to-day -day maintenance and repair operations for both IT hardware and critical infrastructure, such as electrical infrastructure and cooling equipment. Prior to joining uh, Microsoft, Sean also served in the US Navy submarine fleet as an electrician. Sean holds many patents related to data centers and energy, uh, a degree in information technology, uh, he's a certificated project management professional from the Project Management Institute. He enjoys vacationing with his family, fitness, and guitar. Uh, so Sean is an expert in this domain, and uh, we would love to hear from him. Thank you, Sean. Take it over. Thanks for the intro. Okay. I'm going to share my presentation, and we're going to go through this. And hey, since it's such a small group, um, feel free to stop me. Uh, if you have questions rather than waiting to the end, is that okay? Okay. And if you're at the end, you still have questions, you're free to ask them away. So Absolutely. since I'm starting early, that means I get even more time. So, so don't be shy. Okay. So uh, everyone, you can please help me by crossing your fingers for good luck. Okay, share. All right, so let's get started. Um, when when Dee was kind of rattling off my uh, um, my introduction, um, one of the things that uh, I like to brag about is that I've worked in all the aspects of the data center. And usually, when I'm bragging about that, uh, you know, my family and my kids they, they really don't care. Uh, but I'm proud of it. I'm proud of the fact that. Uh, you know, I've worked in data center operations, you know, I've uh, racked servers and cabled servers and con commissioned ser and, and configured servers. I have, uh, you know, ran the generators and uh, maintained the air conditioners and replaced belts uh, in operations. Um, I've worked in the engineering team of, of working with architects and engineers to design data centers for, for building, you know, actual, actual building projects. Uh, and I've also worked in the construction team. So managing the general contractors and all the subcontractors and all the equipment and the logistics to get all that stuff to the, to the site and actually build it and bring it online. One, one project, uh, this is probably the biggest project of my career. That was our Chicago data center. And it, it, it was a very big data center, okay? It was uh, you know, well over hundred megawatts biggest data center I had built. And at the time, maybe 15 years ago, I think it was the biggest data center ever built. And one of the things that needed to be done before we could even start installing generators or electrical gear or stuff like that, is we had to get all the concrete in, right? We had to build all of the foundations. And we were under a very tight time pressure. And in, in the foundations were so enormous that we had basically this long army, this long convoy of dump trucks full of material, just all lined up down the street as far as you could see. And they were coming in and they were, they were dumping all of this foundation material and then driving off. And this was going on 
all three shifts, so 24 hours a day for an entire week, just dumping tons and tons of foundation material at this project. The foundation material was called CA6. So it's basically uh, a, a, a rock. It's been cleaved a certain way, very engineered rock, tons and tons of this little rock and cement powder. And so that laid most of the foundation for this project. And it was just an enormous amount of material. I calculated it was so many, it could fill so many hundred uh, Olympic swimming pools, you know, and I, and I sent that to the rest of, you know, my colleagues at Microsoft and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that's, that is absolutely enormous. And, and now I think to myself, you know, I wonder if we, what if we could have used carbon out of the air, pull carbon out of the air, make the, the aggregate, make the rock out of it and use that for foundation material and actually make a data center carbon negative. So I'm going to talk to you today about an idea to make data centers carbon negative. The other thing I want to really drive home is if this idea can work for a data center, it can work for any building. We're sort of starting with the most mission critical, the, the most risk adverse built environment first. But that, but that just means if it works for a data center. It should also work for warehouses and office buildings and and things of that nature as well. So let's, let's go on this journey. So I'm going to talk about something called embodied carbon. Now, um, I'm in, in, in this group here, uh, who, uh, and you can just, you know, give me some kind of indication, who's been to a mega city? I've got a picture of Manhattan, New York here, but, you know, Shanghai, I've been to Shanghai. Um, that's, that's an enormous, Tokyo is enormous. Um, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, D has. One of the things that you're struck with, unless you have grown up in these concrete jungles, is just the enormity of it. It is so intimidating to just see, you know, to look up and see these giant buildings and to understand what it takes to build one of these buildings. You know, all of the people and all of the material as well. So like my, my example with the data center, I mean, there's probably, you know, much more concrete and steel involved with a lot of these higher buildings here. Okay, just an enormous amount of, of building. Now picture, now this is New York, so certainly not the largest city, but picture the size of New York here, you're looking at it. Well, mankind is building at such a huge rate right now, we're basically building, essentially building a New York every month. Okay, all of these buildings, all of the glass, all the electrical, all of the concrete across the globe. It's an enormous amount of development that's going on. Here's the other dirty secret. Even if every single one of these buildings was powered with renewable energy, there would still be a very large carbon liability associated with them. And that's what embodied carbon is. So this is the way it works. Body carbon is all of the carbon involved with making the building material. So if it's concrete, you know, you have to get all of these minerals, you have to put them in kilns and furnaces, and that's how you make the cement that's essential for the concrete. Okay, so there's a lot of CO2 created. There's uh, even a lot of modern uh, uh, cement factories um, that just use uh, old tires for example, uh, for the heat required. Okay, so very, an enormous amount of, of CO2 and other pollutants as well. But then you have to truck it to the construction site. Okay, so there's more CO2 involved. And you have all the other little, uh, you have all the other large uh, pieces of equipment and tractors and cranes that are running around the site creating the CO2. And so when, this, when the building is finally built, it already has, consumed a lot of CO2 and it's all locked in that building material. That's, that's the embodied carbon. And then you have the operational carbon of, okay, well, where is it getting its power? Is it getting its power from a grid that has a lot of fossil fuels or a grid that has a lot of carbon-free energy? But this is what I said. Even if a, even if a, a city could get to 100% renewable energy, you still had to emit a whole lot of carbon in order to build those those buildings. 
Currently, embodied carbon accounts for about 11% of global greenhouse gases. And so that's not a lot compared to industry, compared to transportation, but and, and the building operations as well. But there's a lot of work going on to, to clean up these other industries. Transportation, right? There's a lot of uh, EV, uh, electric vehicles that are coming out of the market. Um, there's experimentation with hydrogen fuel cells to power larger systems like trains and buses and things of that nature. Okay, there's just a lot of work to, to move and, 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 carbon and make these other industries carbon free. But what have we heard about just making the building materials carbon free? So it's one of these little areas here that isn't getting a lot of attention uh, until recently. Um, I think uh, everybody's familiar with Microsoft's carbon goal. We want to not only be 100% carbon free, we want to be carbon negative by 2023. So that does, so that requires a, a few things. Number one is we need to turn off the CO2 valve right now. So we need to clean up all of our industry, uh, all of our different aspects of our business. And that's not only the energy that we consume, but it's also all of the embodied carbon as well. But then we want to go negative. We're not good enough with just getting to one point. You know, when I, when I read this, I'm like, oh, I'm really proud of Microsoft. That's a really bold goal. And then I thought to myself, wait, how are we going to get negative? Well, there's a lot of strategies involved and it's things that are very conventional like planting trees and things of that nature to balance. Um, but you know me, I, I'm an innovator. I wanna see if there's a better way of doing it. And this is why I'm gonna talk more about these carbon negative or carbon sequestering materials. So a data center, how much embodied carbon is, is associated with the data center? Well, first of all, we broke down all the different aspects of the data center, okay? So you, like I said, you've got all the structure, enclosure, you get the, you know, all the steel, you have all the concrete. Um, you got a bunch of other sources as well, like just your equipment that's going in there. You have uh, all of the aluminum that's in the equipment, all of the steel that's in equipment. MEP stands for mechanical electrical plumbing. So, you know, when I order an air handler, it's got a bunch of copper, it's got a bunch of aluminum that, that builds this, this air handler system. But right off the bat, the, the, what was obvious to us is the area that we need to focus on first is just the building envelope, all the steel and concrete. So a typical data center is going to have about 500 megatons of CO2 per megawatt of embodied carbon. So if you have a 100 megawatt data center, okay, there's going to be a lot of embodied carbon associated with that. There's a lot that data centers can do right off the bat to reduce all of that. So one of the things is you can just shop around. So when it's time for your construction team to buy the steel and buy the cement and buy the concrete, instead of just choosing a supplier based on price, you can also choose a supplier based on how much embodied carbon is associated with that material. And this requires a very standard measuring process. So Microsoft has sponsored the construction of a tool called EC3, Embodied Carbon and Construction Calculator. Not a very sexy name, but it's very effective. One of the things that's important is, like I said, that you're able to evaluate all these different suppliers on an equal playing field. So in order for the embodied carbon and construction calculator to work, suppliers have to submit what's called an EPD, an environmental, an environmental product disclosure. And it's kind of like the nutrition label on your food, right? It breaks down how much CO2, it breaks down any other pollutants as well. And you can get all this information into this tool and this tool is available for everybody. And then you're able to then see, okay, if I go with supplier A, my building's gonna have so much embodied carbon. And now, you, now we're able to sort of, like I said, shop around. We can be like, look, you know, I can pay a half a percent more for cement and get it from supplier, you know, let, let's, let's take steel, for example. Maybe I've got one supplier that uses, um, you know, coal 
to, to heat up its foundries. Or I've got one supplier that has their foundry in a grid that's very carbon intensive, uh, you know, Wyoming, for example. But then I've got supplier B. Supplier B uses all electric arc furnaces to melt all that steel for in the foundry. And they're using 100% carbon free energy to power that. Well, that's going to drop the embodied carbon of that steel precipitously. Okay, so I can sort of shop around and see who has got the lowest embodied carbon. So that, that's one, you know, very, very, um, that's one very short term way to reduce embodied carbon. But then another way is, well, maybe I can just build the data center out of materials that do not require emitting carbon and actually pull carbon out of the air. So I'm talking about biogenic type materials. I'm talking about materials that I can grow like algae-based blocks. So there's a number of different technologies around growing algae and using that to create concrete structures like blocks, like cement. During the algae growing process, the algae is pulling CO2 out of the air. When I put that algae into my mix to make the CO2, all that CO2 that it pulled out it's now locked up and dead. It's now in the structure. There's no chance of it leaking out. There's no chance of, 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 that, of that CO2 going back into the atmosphere someday. It is now locked up and sequestered inside of the building. There's a lot of other different areas inside of the data center that can benefit from these carbon negatives, uh, the, these biogenic type materials. Um, for example, you've got uh, biofiber. Biofiber, you know, I think humankind's been building with wood for a very, very long time. And so we, we sort of understand, like, you can build things out of, out of fibrous cellulose type, type material. So that's not extremely disruptive. Um, it's not very industrial. When you picture in your head, you, you, you picture industrial applications like data centers to have a lot of steel and a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of concrete. Um, but it's going to require us to think differently. You might walk into a data center in the future and see more cellulose type materials holding things up. Synthetic limestone in the, in the concrete slab is another good area. When it comes to concrete, what you're trying to do to reduce embodied carbon is you're trying to displace as much of the Portland cement as possible. So your basic recipe for concrete is you get some cement, right? And that's been cooked in the kilns at the cement factory. Uh, you get some water and then you'll, you'll, you'll put fillers in it like rocks or sand, um, mix all that up and it does its magic and it gets hard. And so that in that block that you just made or that slab that you just made, all the embodied carbon, most of the embodied carbon, not all of it, is coming from that Portland cement. So if you can use something else and use less and less in, uh, Portland cement, or maybe even not need Portland cement at all, then you're really going to reduce the amount of body carbon associated with it. <clears throat> so that's the slabs. Um, the same thing can be applied on walls as well. Um, there's also some good recycling opportunities. Uh, Alki activated cement is something that's being, that's starting to be used in the construction industry. And I actually have standby. This is what it looks like. So this is basically ground up glass and you're able to process this way or process this in a certain way so that you can displace a lot of that Portland cement. So you're recycling glass, you're getting good recycling uh, benefits out of it. And you're also displacing the Portland cement. But the stuff that takes it negative, the stuff that, that's, that's, that's really awesome are the biogenic stuff like the algae-based stuff. And then there's also mycelium, mushroom material that's very effective at structural insulation. Um, my house is built out of structural foam walls. So I don't have, you know, most, most buildings have like studs in the walls. So in, in the, all of my exterior walls, there's, there's no studs. I have foam that's sandwiched in between plywood. So the structural insulated panel 
is something that's used in the industry a lot, but it uses the old fashioned foam, right? That makes little balls and stuff like that. There's a lot of work in laboratories to replace that with mycelium insulation. So you still get all of the really good insulation properties. It's still structural. So, you know, like my roof is sitting on these things. It's still structural. But during the creation of the mycelium, you're sucking carbon out of the air. And like I said, you're locking it up inside of that building. Okay, so if this all sounds like, yeah, Sean, yeah, I, I've heard people's hopes and dreams and ambitions, and I've heard a lot of ideas. Uh, well, the good news is, is we're actually doing it. So let me show you some examples. So number one, we think we can greatly reduce the embodied carbon immediately just by using better materials. So I talked about the glass plosalins, you know, the alkali activated cement that I showed you. You know, here's us uh, pouring slabs, testing it, making sure it's data center ready. Something else that you might not see in this slab, if you're familiar with slabs, you don't see any rebar. So rebar is an enormous amount of steel. And again, steel has a lot of embodied carbon associated with it. But we were able to pour this slab without rebar. Well, anybody can pour a slab without rebar, well, but what happens? It cracks. It just turns into chunks after a while. If you've driven on it, if you've put heavy equipment on it, there's just chunks of stuff that's on it. What we were able to use is a new material called uh, uh, microfiber helix. And so here is a picture of that as well. And so instead of using rebar, we just use a small amount of this metallic fiber. And this is sufficient to keep the slab intact. There's a lot of benefits of reducing carbon. It is also logistically superior as well, because you don't have to have all of the time to build all of the rebar that's in place before you pour the slab. You're able to get in there, pour the slab immediately. Carbon negative materials are in the lab, but I'll show you what we're doing to accelerate the adoption and, and the commercialization of that. So like I said earlier, these biogenic type materials. This is where, this is where we wanna to get to, the biogenic stuff, because that's gonna get us to a carbon negative situation. So right now we're testing cylinders of this stuff. If you know anything about cement, one of the first things you do before you pour the slab, and then you find out the mix wasn't just right, you maybe had too much water or not enough aggregate. Before you do that, you, you, you create what's called these cylinders. So you just make a small thing, you let that cure over time, and then you actually put it in a, in, a, in a compressor and you test how much strength it has associated with it. And so you just keep pressing until it breaks. You say, okay, this is rated for 4,500 PSI or whatever your specification is. So we're testing that right now. So we've got good results there. What this is going to do is this is gonna feed into a test project where we build a slab and we build a wall and we'll be able to test this stuff. We'll be able to test it structurally be able to test the, just the construction of it as it's set up in the amount of time that we've assumed. You know, once you pour concrete, you have to wait for it to get to the right hardness, okay? Um, and this isn't a next year thing. This is something that will be done by June as well, okay? So you know, we're being very aggressive with this stuff and we want to get this into, into the lab, de-risk it as much as we can in the lab and then actually get it out into a data center. Now, I can't tell you, I can't commit to you right now that we're going to take this and uh, we're going to build an entire data center out of it yet. We're going to see how this goes first. <laughs> Maybe it'll end up being just wall, one wall if it's high enough risk. But the whole point of this is Microsoft's leadership, Microsoft's execs are saying, listen, we're willing to take risks to accelerate the commercialization of this stuff because we all recognize if we let this stuff just kind of commercialize organically, it's gonna take way too long, right? And time is of the essence with technologies like this. I think we can all agree. All right, right now I'm just gonna do a little more deep dive into exactly how do you get to carbon negative building materials. So up at the top, we're gonna to call this OPC, Ordinary Portland Cement. And so, like I said, what happens is you're gonna need about a ton of CO2 at the factory. 
at the cement factory just to build a ton of cement. Now, cement isn't concrete. Cement is just one ingredient. The next process is, is then you're going to create the mix. And then you're going to have your concrete. So now at this point, no matter what you do, you've already emitted a bunch of carbon into the air just to get to this stage. Okay, you haven't even put your, uh, uh, you haven't even converted your building over to renewable energy or solar panels or anything yet. You, you already have this liability. What we're seeing with the carbon negative opportunity is first of all, let's start out with getting to this binder that's as low a body, in body carbon as possible. So we're gonna use a lot of recycled materials. We're gonna use a lot of uh, uh, advanced materials that do not require all of that, um, uh, uh, all, that car all, all that energy intensive process. Um, one company actually pulls the CO2 out of other flues. So you can see like, you know, some other carbon intensive process it will capture the CO2 that's out of that flu. And then we use that to create uh, the aggregate that's gonna go into the cement mix. So that's, that's one way. Um, also, uh, the algae is the other way as well. So instead of using, like I said, this Portland cement, there's species of algae that can act as that binder to hold everything together to make it hard. So again, the recipe down here, ordinary Portland cement, you need water, you need that binding material. Okay, that's the stuff wherever that I talk about, this Portland cement, it's very carbon intensive. Uh, you'll use some kind of a sand, a fine aggregate to hold things together. You'll also mix that with larger aggregates, you know, so just, just like rocks. And then you finally get to um, uh, the end here. So the alkai activated mix, it should get us to carbon negative if we get through this lab process. So we're gonna start out with, right off the bat, we're gonna use more of an alkali solution. We're gonna use, and this is recycled materials. We're gonna use slag. So this is recycled materials as well. Sand is sand, but thank goodness the earth has plenty of sand. Um, but when we get to the point where we need to add the rocks, here's an opportunity where we can use not just rocks, but we can use material, we can use special rocks that have been made perhaps through this process that I talked about over here, where it's pulling CO2 out of something, and then we're creating and we're converting that that CO2 gas into a CO uh, to a carbon black, something that, that we can use as an aggregate. And then uh, to take it even further negative, we're using an algae-based limestone in the in, like I said, in the lab project. And all of this will get us to some figure of carbon negative yet. We're still doing the calculations, but um, um, you know, our first mix will be one thing, but we're shooting for, you know, number one, it has to work really well. Uh, you know, we, we can't have structural issues. So that's the very, very first um, priority for this, um, for this program. I'll keep everybody posted too. We'll, we'll, we'll of course um, publicize what we're doing here. So in summary, here's my banner, it's still under construction. In summary, we're going from a, a, a world where construction is very, very carbon intensive. Okay, I need, to, I need to collect it, I need to process it, transfer it, uh, transport it, and then all the construction, and then it's finally into the building to a stage where we're using materials that are drawing CO2 out of the air, locking them up into the building where the CO2 is, is then sequestered. So this is very, 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 very new stuff. We got a lot of really good, op, uh, really good partnerships with startups, with universities uh, that we're using to test this. And we're also being very um, public with this. We're trying to evangelize this to all of our general contractors uh, and even our competitors as well. Um, because, you know, the more, the more this gets used, the faster it's going to accelerate into full commercialization so that the price will come down and that uh, the future when we're building these Manhattan size, you know, construction activities once a month, we can be doing this materials that's pulling the CO2 out of the air. Oh. And if there are any questions.
I'm standing by. It's very impressive. Uh, thank you, Sean. Uh, very thoughtful. Uh, it's really pioneering work. Um, so uh, I'm just curious, uh, maybe this is because of my lack of knowledge of this. Uh, so the, the data center, once you build uh, with this material, uh, since we need to operate data center maybe for more than 10 years or so, uh, is it going to you know, suck the carbon throughout the entire lifetime or at some point it will be saturated and you, know, uh, you need to replace them of some sort? Uh, no, once, once the data center is built, all of the carbon activity is done. So even if you're building with the old stuff, it's not gonna, the, 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 the steel and cement, they're not gonna continue to sort of exhaust CO2. And it's the same with this material. Once I've built with it, it's not gonna continue to suck CO2 out of the air. It's in the process of building it. Okay, it's all the way at the beginning. So when I need to have my materials built, I can either do it in a very carbon intensive way or I can do it in a carbon negative way. I see, I see. Yeah. Makes sense, makes sense. I have a quick question, uh, cost wise, uh, I mean, how much is the cost for, you know, this reduction in the carbon for this current material? Is it much more expensive than, you know, cement or? I'm glad you asked that. It is much more expensive, yeah. but it's cheap for a data center. Let me explain to you why. Um, if you were to build a, uh, a warehouse, the cost of that project is going to be very, very sensitive to your building materials because it's a very simple system, right? It's just a building envelope. It's, it's, it's a concrete floor, concrete walls, and a roof. And so when you look at the cost of that, the cost of your materials are going to have a huge effect on the total cost of that project. That's not the case for a data center. Even if data center companies like Microsoft, Google, AWS, even if we have to pay two or three times the cost for cement, the cost of our project is not very sensitive to the cost of the building materials, right? It's in all the equipment. It's in all the servers that are in there. And so this is another, and this is why I think the data center industry will be the leader is because I believe that the hyperscale companies can afford to pay a little bit more for their concrete and their CO2. It's not gonna move the, the, the cost of the, of the project very much at all, but it's gonna help accelerate this stuff. So we're gonna be the early adopters. And then we all know scale. Scale is what drives down the cost of new technologies. So it'll start with the hyperscalers. And as we buy more and more and we, we build more data centers, we're gonna get those immediate benefits we're going to give the technology credibility. Look, you're using it in a mission critical facility, right? You're using it in a data center, but we're also going to be helped to scale and driving down the cost so that other industries can then afford to use it as well. Uh, compared to, you know, I'm not very familiar with the construction of data center, but, you know, with my limited knowledge, um, there's lots of cooling, right, that has to be done within the data center. With this new material, do you require like more cooling systems or less cooling systems within the inside? Uh, no, it wouldn't require more or less. But since I have time, I'm going to tell a quick story. Um, insul I talked about insulation, mm -hmm. and and so that's kind of the, kind of one of the factors here. Is is what if what if I built my building out of old, you know, conventional concrete uh, and steel and insulation, and what if I built a, another one out of this biogenic carbon negative stuff? Right? And is the cooling going to go up? Well, where, how could that happen? Well, it's all in the insulation, right? So as the sun's beating down on that building, if I have poor insulation, it's gonna heat the building up more. I'm gonna have higher cooling costs. That's not necessarily the case with a data center because the amount of heat from the sun, what we call the solar load, is just a fraction of the, of the heat compared to the servers. So here's my story. Uh, I was managing a data center that was right next to an airport. And so our white, our nice white roof it just built up dirt and grime over the years. And in, you know, instead of that white roof doing its job to reflect the solar rays, what was actually happening is um, all that grime was absorbing the solar rays. So it was heating up the roof. And so we had this theory, we're like, hey, since our roof is so grimy, we're heating up it. 
And so we hired contractors to come in and just clean our roof. We cleaned it back to bright white. And we saw our cooling load drop by 150 kilowatts, 150 kilowatts. But this was on a six megawatt data center. So we did see an improvement in cooling, but it was just a fraction of, of the amount of heat load. So it didn't result in a ton of energy efficiency. It was a fun project anyway. I see. So uh, fraction-wise, since you mentioned the, you know, the fraction-wise, uh, the cooling that is required, uh, you know, for the, the servers, how much is it compared to, for example, you know, the outside? Well, I don't understand the question. So, so the, the, the cooling that is required, you mentioned that the fraction of the, the cooling that is required for the service is much more, right? Uh, than you know, the cooling that is required for the ceiling. Um, oh. what, what would be the percentage wise? Like, is it, uh, you know, five to 90%, five and 90% or? Oh no, the solar load, the solar load ends up being less than 1%. Wow, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I think it's getting late for some of the folks. So, uh, yeah, we're, I, I, think, I think I don't have any more questions. Uh, you have, I don't know if you have anything else. Just so, one more quick question. Yeah. Um, any possible collaborations from academia, uh, you know, to work on this project, what would, that, what would that be? And what would it require for, you know, academia to collaborate on such project? Thanks for asking that question. Here's my ask. We need better binders. So that's the first thing we need. So we're looking at certain species of algae of binding this. We're looking at some species of mycelium. We're just getting started and there isn't a lot of work in this area. So more work in the area of carbon sequestering building materials would be fantastic. Um, the other is converting CO2 into hard stuff, converting CO2 into solids where then we can do something with. That's the other thing. And the reason why that second one is so important, look, we all see that there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of advancements in direct air capture of CO2, but then what do you do when you have captured the CO2? There is not a good story there. Oh, you can just pump it into salt caverns. Okay, that's great if you have salt caverns. Um, and still there's that question, what if there's a leak, right? That is not a good solution. We need to be able to turn all that CO2 that we're capturing into something that we know is not going to escape. It would be even better if we could recycle that CO2 into something that's not being used. So those are the, those are my two asks uh, of academia. I think this is you know very fascinating uh, work uh, and very innovative as well. Thank you for sharing all this information with us, you know, through the AMDC workshop. This is great. Yeah, absolutely. It's my pleasure. Uh, are there any other efforts from other companies, like, you know, competitors that are doing something similar or Microsoft is the only one that is leading this now? Yeah, uh, every one of us are trying to figure out ways to lower our embodied carbon. Uh -huh. so, so embodied carbon, we all recognize is an issue. We're all trying to lower it. Uh, my hope is, though, is that these carbon negative technologies are not a Microsoft thing. My hope is that soon this will be an industry thing, and then soon other industries will then be able to adopt it as well. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you again, Sean. Uh, thank you for the time. Uh, really nice talk. See you soon. Thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. I guess we can conclude the, the workshop. Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah, so we have come to an end. So uh, thanks for all the authors and the participants. Um, this is great. Thank you so much, uh, Dee, for working with me on, on this. And hopefully next year, you know, all we right. can uh, do it again. All right. Thank you, everyone.